who has who has the most to teach us about surviving a Trump administration? Um, possibly Argos, who kept all of his hundred eyes wide open all of the time and kept looking. Although then he got screwed over and they wound up being put into the tail of a peacock anyway, so. As I delved into Neil's biography, uh, getting ready for tonight, I've realized that he touched or invented several of the universes that I used to visit as a child. So in an order that might surprise even Neil, um, starting with Don't Panic, a companion to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, true to the comic books of 2000 and AD and Judge Dredd, not to mention several episodes of Doctor Who. The, <laughs> save the applause for Neil, please. Um, but also including the quintessential episode of Babylon 5, named Day of the Dead. Um, his authorship is found at the heart of many of these creations. Then to change tracks, more recently in 2013, I find that Neil penned an article for The Guardian entitled, Why Our Future Depends on Libraries, Reading, and Daydreaming. This passion continues today and is yet one more reason that proves why authors and libraries belong together. And now in his latest release, Norse Mythology, Neil fashions primeval stories into a novelistic arc beginning with the genesis of the legendary Nine Worlds, delving into the exploits of deities, dwarves, and giants, and culminates in Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, and the rebirth of a new time and people. At BPL, we have this work now joining the 247 other copies of works authored by Neil here in the collection. So, tonight, we celebrate Neil and his work as we meet at the intersection of reading, writing, and the imagination, please join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator, Jared Bowen, and welcome back our guest for tonight, Neil himself, Neil Gaiman. The white questions are your questions. The blue questions are mine. The blue cards are mine, and we'll... we'll coalesce and we'll have a great evening asking all of your questions, but let me start with Norse mythology. And so clearly you didn't want Chris Hemsworth to have the definitive <laughs> take on the North, Norse gods. I love Chris Hemsworth. Hemsworth. I think he actually pulls off Thor incredibly well, um, putting, putting the Marvel comics Thor on the screen. And, and Marvel is where it started for me, you know, I, and I'm, I, even acknowledge it in the introduction. I would have been about seven years old, six or seven, and there were Marvel comics in the UK that were reprints of the American Marvels. And, and what was fun is they started at the very beginning. So um, there was a comic called, I think, Fantastic with an exclamation mark. And the very first story about the mighty Thor I ever read was, was uh, Dr. Mild-mannered Dr. Don Blake trapped in a cave in Norway by, I think, aliens um, <laughs> and a rockfall, um, as you do. And he finds a stick in the back of the cave. And he's using the stick to try and bang away the rocks. And suddenly there is a clap of thunder and he is transformed into the mighty Thor. And the stick becomes Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, which I thought was brilliant. So I spent the rest of my childhood banging sticks. <laughs> you know, any walking sticks, canes, occasionally just things that have fallen off trees that look possible. Um, and it, it was never worked, but I did not give up because, you know, you have to obviously, Don Blake had had to bang a lot of sticks before he was transformed into Thor. So I, I, that was how I discovered Norse mythology. And then very rapidly, now I was curious. I wanted to know more about this, you know, who these people were. And I got a copy of a book called Myths of the Norsemen 
by Roger Lancelin Green. Um, and I suddenly discovered that actually Thor wasn't like he was in the comics, and Loki wasn't really like he was in the comics. And, and actually Asgard wasn't this amazing science fictional, glorious place. It was basically, you know, a wall and inside it a bunch of halls and little courts and things, but um, it all felt a lot more real and a lot more weird, even than Jack Kirby. And Jack Kirby did a lot of weird stuff. Well, I was struck by the fact that you've just written this now, but as you just explained, they have been living with you, I would presume, for a very long time. I and mean, have they just been kind of circulating in there and this is the right time for them to come out? So, November the 10th, 2008 is a date that I remember, not just because it was my birthday, um, which it was, and not just because um, a woman that I didn't know very well but, but quite liked, named Amanda Palmer, um, she, she surprised me that day in a park as a human statue when I was not expecting it. She just told me she was sitting there reading and I, and I went up to the park to say hello uh, from this lunch that I'd had and I turned up very late because she told me that she was sitting on a bench reading and I figured, well, people who are reading, you don't disturb them. They, you know, why would, she'll probably be grateful for another 15 minutes reading. And what I didn't know is she was dressed as a bride and standing on a box and it was cold. <laughs> um, and I walked up there with my agent and, and suddenly I turned a corner and there is this bride on a box and I say, ah, and I pull out some money and I put it in the basket and she gives me a flower. And I say, uh, Merrily, this is Amanda, Amanda, this is Merrily. Um, <laughs> and we go off and I say to Amanda, you must have been so cold. She says, no, 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 I'm a human statue. We do not feel the cold. <laughs> In later years, particularly after getting married, I have discovered exactly how long she stood there and just how cold she was. Um, but the lunch that I came from was a lunch with a lovely lady named Amy Cherry from Norton Books. And Amy was asking me to do a book retelling myths. And I said, I don't know, let me think about it. And I thought about it for probably about a year before I said, yes, I think I will do this. And then I thought about it having said yes for probably another two years before I, I thought, okay, I think, and, I, and a lot of that was rereading the prose editor and the poetic editor and, and chewing over what I was doing and how I would tell the story. and. Eventually, I realized, okay, I think I know the voice. I think I know how I can do this. And I started doing it, and I, I, I explained, I came up with an analogy the other night in Seattle, which pleased me, so I will use it again tonight. Um, I said it was, it was, as projects go, it was like those people who have knitting in their bag that sometimes during the downtime, they pull out their knitting and, you know, they're waiting at the dentist, whether they may do some knitting. And this was my knitting. It was not, it was the thing I did between things. I read the very first story um, at the MFA in, I think, about 2013. And I, I, by that point, I had maybe three stories, and I just wanted to find out if they worked for an audience. So here in Boston, I did this event where basically it was no cameras, no recording, and I am actually swearing everybody in the room to secrecy. <laughs> and bless them, everybody was. It's, it, it, you know, there were. 400 people there and nobody said a word. Nobody went out and said he is doing this book. And I had learned that the stories read okay and the voice that I picked worked. So I, I carried on doing my knitting. Um, finally in about 2015, Amy Cherry, my long-suffering and incredibly patient editor, 
said, you know, that, that lunch was in 2008. Um, <laughs> could we expect a book soon? And, and I, I thought, you know, I'm nearly there, actually, on this. So I took a week in, at the beginning of 2016 and just did nothing else but wrap up the few stories that I hadn't wrapped up and just make sure that it read it all through, make sure it worked, and I sent it off, and I was very proud. And it came out in February of this year, went straight to number one on the New York Times list, then stayed there, and then dropped to number two, and then went back up to number one, and is now... And meanwhile, had done the same thing in England, and in Canada, it's simply been number one for eight weeks, and the number one. And people say, well, you must have expected this. And I say, no, if I'd expected this, it would have been done in 2009. <laughs> um, well, as you were writing this, you're dealing with these tales that have been told for generation after generation, just for eons. How much license did you feel you had I felt I had the kind of license that you have in jazz or in telling a joke where there are things that you can change and there are things you can't change. Um, I couldn't change what happened. I couldn't invent material out of whole cloth. But what I could do was work on the way that something was told. The dialogue was mine. The voice is mine, even if the events are the events of the story. Um, you know, if you're, you're telling a joke and the way that the joke is printed is simply a man walks into a bar and sits down and looks across and there is an elephant on the other side of the room. And, but the way you may tell that is so there's a guy, he's had a long day at work, he's exhausted, he thinks, you know, what I really need is a drink. And he heads out and he finds a little bar on the corner, goes down some stairs, it's cool there, it's nice. He orders himself a drink, sits down at the table, looks around and sitting across the room is the biggest grayest, most elephantine elephant he's ever seen, and it's sipping a gin and tonic. And, and you kind of, that's how you tell the story. So I took Snorri Sturluson's prose edda, and occasionally, in some cases, some of the poems from the prose edda, as my what happened. Um, and occasionally, I would allow myself to buttress something that happened from another story. Um, for example, there's a story in which Thor and goes off to the land of the giants. And he, um, that he stays, he and Loki stay with a family and there's nothing to eat. So Thor kills his goats as you do. They cook and eat the goats, but he tells them not to break the goat bones in any way. And at the end of the meal, he puts, they, they take the goat bones, he puts them on the goat skin, says a magic word, and now his goats are whole again. But a, a boy, the farmer's son, uh, Thialfi, he has broken a goat bone to get at the marrow, and now the goat is, uh, is limping. And that's the way the story is in the prose Edda. But there's also a story um, where he goes off to try and get a, a giant ale pot to brew ale in from the giants. And as he's fleeing with his goats, the lame one stumbles and falls. And Thor curses Loki, whose fault it was that the goat was lame. As a result of which, I felt absolutely fine about going back into the first story and having Loki take the kid aside and say, you know, the only reason he's told you not to eat the goat marrow is because 
that's how you grow up big and strong like Thor, so go ahead, do it, and the kid does. Because I felt like, okay, I have enough justification from that other story to go in and put in a buttressing piece of corroborative detail um, that makes the story feel actually a little more likely. Why would this kid, you know, you, you've got the thunder god has just turned up and he's told you, don't touch the bones, you don't touch the bones. <laughs> You just mentioned Loki, and there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of trickery and treachery in all of these stories. And, and I was thinking as I was reading this, if you think that these are the foundational stories of humankind and mankind, and this is what we learned, then you come away with a bit of a cynical look at how we got this way, given the trickery and treachery. I think what you've got, um, I, Loki is, is, is a wonderful entity in his own right, because... To this day, if you get five Norse scholars together, and believe me, I have talked to many Norse scholars uh, over the last few years and asked them, so what is Loki? You will get five answers or possibly 15 answers as they start quoting other people. Um, because he is this glorious anomaly. Um, exactly who he is and what he's doing there. They, they're going, well, maybe he's a giant, maybe, you know, his father was a giant, but then there are other gods in Asgard who were, have, you know, his mother is called Laufey. He's always referred to as Loki, son of Laufey. He is, for reasons never adequately explained, a blood brother to Odin, and Odin owes him a favor. Um, I, you know, that there's all of this stuff, and he is, and he starts out as sort of in that sort of Prometheus kind of way of just being a little bit smarter than the rest of the gods, but he goes darker and darker, and um, and there's also the weirdness of the fact that there's almost nowhere named after Loki, mm -hmm. so you get the feeling that maybe nobody. Nobody was worshipping him. You know, Thor, there are, there are thousands upon thousands of places with Thor's name in their place, uh, place name, meaning that they were sacred to him or they just wanted to appease him or maybe they thought that if they named their place after him, he'd be happy with them or something like that. But, but Loki doesn't get places named after him. That's the first audience question, which I had at the top and is now somewhere in the middle, <laughs> but I remember what it was. What is it about gods? What is it about gods? What a great question. <laughs> um, what it is about gods is that they are projections. They are things, they are, they are blank screens upon which we can see ourselves. They are masks that we can step behind and then step out of. Um, they are things that are both ways of explaining why the world is the way that it is, which is a peculiar thing to try and understand anyway. Was for primitive man, is now. So they allow us to, to explain the world and they also give us the stories we can tell about the world that allows us to make the world comprehensible. Um, and also, you, you always feel that different cultures get the gods they need. You know, the, the, the biggest, I mean, the Norse gods I love because they're so dark and vaguely doomed and everything is cold and unpleasant. And, and you compare them. People say, well, why not the Greek gods? What's the difference between them and the Greek gods? And you're going, well, the Greek gods are always sort of, you know, lounging, mostly naked, <laughs> and staring at their reflections in pools, or, you know, chasing nymphs through, through sylvan glades. Um, you know, you can't, you can't lounge nakedly beside a pool in Norse mythology. You will either freeze to death or be got by mosquitoes. It's, it's, this, this is a place where you better keep warming and go and make a fire. And you definitely get the feeling that you are reading the stories of people in an 
inhospitable world. These are not hospitable stories. The stories of the Greeks, you're going, okay, the world is fundamentally comfortable. There are grapes everywhere. <laughs> Audience follow-up question to that. Which figure, this is not my question, because we're going to get a little partisan here. Which figure from Greek or Norse mythology has the most to teach us about surviving a Trump administration? <laughs> oh. What a glorious question. Um, it's been... It's been very odd with, with questions about the book that have to do with, with the Trumpness of Trump. Um, I had somebody on, on Facebook uh, who got very angry with me because the New York Times talked about the laughter in the room when I read the story about how they decide to build an enormous wall around Asgard to keep the frost giants out. And, uh, he was like, oh my God, you know, it's, why would you buckle to, to, to trendiness and do, and I had to say, no, it's a 1,500-year-old story, really. <laughs> it's not Saturday Night Live. I, um, and, and my favorite question so far from an NPR interviewer was, have we reached peak Ragnarok yet? And I got to say, no, no, we are, we are very early days of Ragnarok. Um, who, has, who has the most to teach us about surviving a Trump administration? Um, possibly Argos, who kept all of his hundred eyes wide open all of the time and kept looking. Although then he got screwed over and they wound up being put into the tail of a peacock anyway, so... <laughs> There you go, it's the Trumpness of Trump again. Do you have a favorite god? I don't have a favorite god. Um, I have a few favorites. I love Anansi um, and the, the, the spider god. And I, I did an entire book called Anansi Boys just so that I could tell Anansi stories, um, which, which I fell in love with. Um, in, in Norse mythology, a lot of people say to me, well, obviously, it's obvious that your, I read this, and obviously your favorite god is Loki. And I thought, no, he's not, actually. My, my two favorites are probably Freya, who I love writing because she's completely no-nonsense, no bullshit, is not about to be handed over to anybody in marriage and knows her own mind, and a god called Kvasir, about which we know very little, but... Um, but he's smart. He's like, and he's not, cra uh, you know, Odin is crafty. Odin is cunning and crafty and does cunning, crafty things. Um, whereas um, Kvass is like Sherlock Holmes. He actually sort of figures things out and is so clever that evil dwarves make his blood into mead. So, yeah, the two of them, those two. Speaking of the goddesses, how did you look at them? A and how did you look at them through the prism of the 21st century? Mostly with a great deal of frustration. And the frustration tended to be um, because we don't have many of their stories yet. Um, and I say yet as if maybe one day a trove will show up, um, which it almost definitely won't. The, we have, there are, there are stories that we have, we have a lot of Greek myths, for example, because people were writing them down. Um, the, what we have of Norse myths were written down um, long after Christianity had come in to, um, you know, had taken over the world of the Norse, and they were written down Mostly so that by, by a man called Snorri Sturluson and Snorri, who was a chieftain and various other things, wrote them down, he said, so that um, poets would be able to understand what were called kennings. And the kennings were 
um, references in Nordic poetry to other things. You know, a simple kenning would be to call the sea the whale road. They traveled on the whale road. Well, that, that's, that's the sea. And that one's kind of obvious. And most of the rest of them are, are obvious as long as you know the story they're from. So if you call gold Freya's ransom or whatever, or, or Freya's tears. And, um, but the trouble was that people didn't understand didn't know the stories, so now he felt that they, had a, they might lose the poems. So he wrote down a bunch of the stories, and they are what have come down to us. Um, it's very obvious that we don't have all of them. We probably don't have a majority of them. We had the ones that Snorri knew, the ones he decided were important, and one of the things that is missing from them are stories of goddesses. And we have so many names of goddesses. You know, there, there was the doctor of the gods. You can't have a doctor of the gods and not have a story about the doctor of the gods, but there is no story about her. They, they, they occasionally crop up at the edges of other stories. Um, but you start thinking, okay, well, women were probably telling stories too. There were probably a lot of great stories about the goddesses, um, and we just do not have them. Norse mythology, too. I don't want to make them up. I feel like I, I you know, it would have been really tempting. And, um, and it's the kind of thing that I can do if I put my fiction head on. You know, we're much more likely uh, to get, you know, Norse goddesses showing up in American Gods, too than we ever would be in Norse mythology too, because Norse mythology, I have to play by the rules. But American Gods is my rules. You just mentioned uh, the mead of poets, and when I was reading that story, I was so struck, because I think it goes to the heart of, of what I do in interviewing artists and talking about creative process, but it really, it, it goes to the question of where creativity comes from. And I wondered, as you were writing this, if, you, if it was an existential moment for you, uh, and if you began to look at your, how it is that you're so creative. Um, you know, how it is that I'm so creative tends to be something that I try not to look at too closely um, on the basis that what happens if I figure it out and then it's done <laughs> and it goes away. So it's like, well, yes, I'm, I'm very creative. That's very good. Now I need to get on with the next thing. And, uh, and I don't know if... Um, you know, Amanda sometimes describes me as a workaholic, and I don't think I am, um, but I'm certainly somebody who loves what I do. It, it's never felt like work. Making stuff up um, doesn't feel like work. Retelling old stories doesn't feel like work. It, it just feels like, you know, it's a joy. It's really the best thing there is. So, um, so where does the creativity come from? I don't know. Maybe, you know, there's all those sort of nice, obvious answers. And I do know that I had a long conversation with my sister recently. We were talking about our, our childhoods and the weirdness of our childhoods. And there was a point where she was saying, you know, but having said that, I wouldn't change anything because if I didn't have my childhood, I wouldn't be here and happy and with my family. And I thought, you know, it's true. If I, if I think you are, how much you've produced. Yeah, daily. I mean, it's always, you know, it, it, it's always a battle between you and a blank piece of paper. And quite often the blank piece of paper wins. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it, it, any long fiction writing process, you are wrestling a bear. And some days you're on top and some days the bear's on top. Um, when I was writing Anansi Boys, I remember phoning my agent, Merrily, and saying, Merrily, I, I really can't do this. This book is rubbish. I'm halfway through it, three quarters of the way through it, and everything I've written is stupid. It's, I don't think I'm ever going to finish it. So you need to tell HarperCollins that you know, we, we will send them their money back, and I'm really sorry, and really, I don't think I'm a writer. Maybe I should just 
get a real job in you know, hotel administration or something. <laughs> and, and I explained all this to her. And I got to the end, and there was a, not even a pause. And she said, oh, you're at that point in the book, are you? <laughs> and, and I said, Hi, you mean I've, I've done this before? And she said, yeah, you've done this before, but most of my clients do this. And I didn't even feel alone in my misery somehow. It was like, <laughs> oh, right, this is, this is a thing, apparently. And it's a thing that I managed to forget. You know, I think I remember that one only because we had that conversation. Um, because the truth is, once, once you've done the thing and it's all done, you no longer remember. I, I, Amanda assures me that from the books that she has read on childbirth, women actually are, are sort of programmed by brains, hormones, and so on and so forth to forget the pain of childbirth. You just, you're allowed to completely forget about it probably until you're lying on that bed going, oh my God, it's happening again. <laughs> and um, I suspect the pain of making a book is very similar. You, once it's out there, you just look proudly. Yes, that is my book. I, I wrote it. It was easy. <laughs> we have another great follow-up audience question to that, to the notion of fatherhood. Um, and the question is, as a new, again, father, has your approach to writing um, from content and methods changed? And this person is an artist and a new mom and says she struggles with finding new ways into ideas in her creative process. What I struggle with, um, mostly as a new father, is finding the time and making the very best use of the time. Going, okay, I, you know, from here to here, I'm being a dad. And so if I'm going to be writing from 1 o'clock to 3.30, I actually have to be writing from 1 o'clock to 3.30. I can't, I'm going to have to get a day's worth of work done during that time. So that's, that for me is the bigger thing, is just going, I, um, I need to use every minute of working. And... Um, I think the most, the biggest thing for me as a, as a parent, um, as an old parent, having done it once before, is, or done it three times before, but a long time ago, um, is I'm much, much, much more cognizant of enjoying every moment, because now I know how fast it goes. You know, when I had my first kids, I thought it was probably going to go very slowly. I was looking around going, well, when are they going to learn to walk? And when are they going to learn to talk? And what about school? And when are they graduating? And, and, and now I know that what actually happens is somebody hands you a baby and you hand it back and you look away and then you look back and now they're starting kindergarten and you look over here for a moment and you look back and they're at high school and... Now they're bringing home their first date and you look away and you look back and they're graduating from college and you're not sure how it all happened like that because it just went. So one of the things I'm trying to do with Ash is just go, okay, the time I give you is the time and I, I want to enjoy that. Um, I suspect I'm much more likely right now to want to write some more children's picture books and probably write some more children's books um, because I have an audience. I have a, a built-in <laughs> audience. And as I discovered when I gave him, actually I didn't give him, my, my, my agent, who I've mentioned now several times, merrily, um, was shocked to discover I didn't have them with me, so sent me the board book versions of the Chew books, The Adventures of a Sneezing Panda, which I started reading to him and discovered that I would normally have to read 15, 20, perhaps 30 times a day to him. Um, to the point where I was you know, cursing the writer for only having done three of these things because everybody has their limits. And Does he make you see things differently? Oh, kids always make you see things differently. 
Um, you know, I think my first graphic novel, um, the first real one, Violent Cases, existed because having Mike, his big brother, who is now 33 and then was three. Um, you know, I, I, I remember seeing things through his eyes and being shocked. I think it, the book began when I threw him over my shoulders and took him up to bed because he wouldn't go to bed. He kept coming down. Finally, I just did that thing, you know, throw him over, walk upstairs and got a flash of my dad doing that to me and sort of beating on his, his back as I was carried upstairs to bed and thinking to myself back then, well, if I had kids, I would never do this to them. <laughs> and suddenly going, oh, okay, there is a thing here about cycles and about about violence and about childhood, and wound up with stuff that I had forgotten, long since forgotten, about my own childhood, just coming back because you're around kids and you're seeing them things through their eyes and you're learning things as they learn them, and going, oh, okay, that was how it worked. I remember that. I remember what it was like when my mother taught me my letters, and she got these wooden letters and painted the consonants blue with blue paint, blue poster paint, and then the vowels we did in red with nail varnish. And, um, and I would make words with them, and that was my favorite toy. And I don't think I'd, th you know, and, and until I had kids of my own, I don't think I'd thought about those letters or, you know, all my lifetime since I was two or three. And then to, to get a sense of your process for a little bit, do you, do you archive these thoughts formally? Do they just swim around in your head and leap out? How do you record these memories, these ideas, these notions? Um, I have lots of notebooks with things written in in no particular order that I can never find again. <laughs> um, which occasionally, but the act of having written things down tends to move things from sort of, uh, you know, short-term memory into long-term memory. And very often, uh, things will irritate me. You know, you write, you write to get rid of a maggot. You write to try and pin something down. You don't write with answers. You write with questions. Um, and you don't write necessarily to find out answers. You just write to try and infect other people with your questions. Uh, th this was a question I really enjoyed. Again, audience questions. Searching, searching, searching. The question was about format, and when an idea comes to you, uh, it must have been gone flying onto the floor. Oh, here it is. We have another format. We have the email questions. So you've, you've written in a variety of formats, teleplay, novel, short story, graphic novel, screenplay. When a new story idea comes to you, does its format come with that, come with it? And if not, at what point and how do you decide what format it's meant to be? So sometimes things turn up with format and then you're lucky. Sometimes they turn up with format and you're wrong. And then the idea sits around for a while, and um, a Nancy Boys I originally thought was a movie, and I remember trying to write it as a film script several times and beginning it, and just going, "This isn't right." Um, there's a story of mine called "Daughter of Owls," which I thought was a poem, and I kept starting it as a poem, and it never quite worked. It seemed hackneyed and weird, and then I went, "Actually, let me try it as a short story," but. Let me try it as if it's been written and told by, by an English writer called John Aubrey, who wrote these brief lives and various sort of wonderful things in, in 17th century England. And so I wrote it as a John Aubrey piece, and suddenly it flew. Um, but for me, a lot of it is sort of looking at the strengths and weaknesses of different media and then trying to think when you get an idea for a story whether it exploits 
the strength, which, which media would, would play to its strengths. Um, comics are really good for making sure that everybody sees the same thing. It's a very visual medium. Um, but you can't do tricky things inside people's heads as easily with comics. Um, whereas in prose, you can do tricky things in people's heads. You can go much trickier because you're giving them just pure words and forcing them to build, um, to build a world with it. But now you don't have pictures. You don't have agreed upon pictures. You don't have agreed upon images. Um, you can't do in prose one of my favorite things in comics, which is the silent panel. In comics, you can have three panels of somebody talking and then just a silent panel. In prose, you'd have to say everybody was quiet, quiet and now you're saying something. <laughs> you're, you're actually, you are making a noise. And the joy of it is that you had something there that was perfectly silent. Um, radio plays. I love radio plays, not a medium that is particularly huge in, in America, although now just sort of starting to gain more traction as the world of audio, as people start to discover the attraction of it, but one that has, has never stopped or died away in the UK. And I love it because it has the immediacy of film. Um, but you're also engaging the imagination. Uh, there's an, a glorious line in the uh, first episode, or the second episode, I think, of uh, the original Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio play, where Arthur Dent turns to his companion while they're stuck in the infinite improbability drive and says, Ford, you are turning into an infinite number of penguins. <laughs> and that's a perfect, wonderful radio moment because you're imagining, you're listening to this, and you have to imagine that. There's no way that you can ever make an infinite number of penguins happen on a screen in any way that is satisfactory. Um, so you're, you're, what you're looking for is strengths and weaknesses of a medium. And when you take something from one medium to another, you then have to figure out how you can translate it. Because all too often, what we think of as um, a faithful adaptation is not going to be a very good adaptation. And, and I learned that because media are different. I, and I learned that, and I was fortunate, I think, enough to learn that on my very first graphic novel, Violent Cases because shortly after it was published, a theatre company in London said, we want to do this on the stage. And I thought, whoa, that's amazing, great. And they did it as an absolutely faithful um, adaptation in that it begins with somebody telling you a story in the graphic novel. So basically somebody came on stage, sat down, and did the graphic novel content as if it was um, as, as their script. And I'm mouthing along in the back row very proudly because they hadn't changed anything. Except that things that were big and painful and horrible in the graphic novel were nothing when they were on the stage. But moments that were um, almost trivial in the graphic novel gained enormous weight by being on the stage. And now it was much lighter and fluffier and you sort of got to the end and you went, well, what was the point of that? Which I don't think people did when they read the graphic novel. It, and I realized that even though all of the words were the same, people had had a completely different experience because of the change in media. And, and that was such an important thing, I think, to learn and to learn young because it meant that I was just less precious and much more interested in, okay, what makes, 
what are the strengths of a medium? What are the differences? Um, when I was writing Good Omens, which is a, I, that's mostly what I've actually been doing for the last few years, um, is writing a six part, six hour, six hour long episodes, full hours, um, adaptation of Good Omens, which the BBC is going to be making for Amazon.com. Um, which, which means we have the BBC's uh, experience and, and drama allied to enough money to actually make it. <laughs> um, which I'm quite looking forward to. And, but, I, I, but when I got to the last episode of that, to episode six, I sort of looked at what Terry and I had done in the book, and basically the last episode would consist of everybody saying goodbye. I mean, you just sort of, it would, it would have been even more interminable than the last episode, the last part of Lord of the Rings. It just would have been like, <laughs> you would have been sitting there going, this has to end soon, or perhaps I will just stab myself in the eye a lot. <laughs> so I had to go, okay, how can I be absolutely true to what Terry and I did in the novel while at the same time keeping a plot that is ticking and people care about and that there's stuff going on until 59 minutes and 30 seconds into this. And it was really hard. I, I spent a lot of, I spent many weeks cursing Terry Pratchett, who, for being dead, and <laughs> not at the end of a telephone so I could ring him up and go, Terry, what do I do? And, and I kept knowing, and, and I, I sort of built this Terry in my head, because I went, well, I know what he'd say. He would go, ah, grasshopper, the answer is in the way you phrase the question. <laughs> and I would go, that's not helpful, Terry. <laughs> And so I, I was like, okay, I know the beginning of this. I just have to know what he would say then. And, and when I did come up with it, then I get even more angry with Terry for being dead because it was like I wanted to ring him and tell him, I did it, I solved it. I solved it using going, what would Terry do if we were doing this together? And, and I figured it out. Um, and I couldn't tell him either. And, and both of those things hurt because my friend wasn't there anymore. Um, but it was that thing where you've taken something from one medium to another and what is important is what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, what's real about what you're doing. So before I ask about another adaptation, which I think everyone is anticipating for American Gods, before we leave the Norse Gods, I don't know if you wanted to do a, a read us a, a portion? I, yes, I thought it would be fun to, to do a little reading. Um, and I also thought it would be fun to read a bit that I've literally never read in public before. Um, and, uh, hang on, I'm gonna... So I've, I've been doing a sort of small evening with Neil Gaiman answering questions tour for the last week and I've been reading a few of the Norse mythology stories. But I've never read this one, and I'm actually not gonna read the whole of it. It's from a story called The Children of Loki. And uh, at the beginning of the story, we learn that Loki has gone off and had some children with a giantess who Odin has had very bad dreams about these children. And the gods go off into the land of the giants. They find these three children. They bring them back. One is an enormous serpent whom Odin casts into the sea. One is a girl half dead and half alive. Her left hand side is dead. Her right hand side is alive. And Odin takes her and gives her hell. Her name is Hell, and he gives her the kingdom of Hell to look after. That was two of Loki's children. 
with Angarboda, dealt with then. One in the ocean, one to the darkness beneath the earth. But what to do with the third? When they had brought the third and smallest of Loki's children back from the land of the giants, it had been puppy-sized. And Tyr had scratched its neck and its head and played with it, removing its willow muzzle first. It was a wolf cub, gray and black, with eyes the color of dark amber. The wolf cub ate its meat raw, but it spoke as a man would speak, in the language of men and the gods, and it was proud. The little beast was called Fenrir. It, too, was growing fast. One day, it was the size of a wolf, the next the size of a cave bear, then the size of a great elk. The gods were intimidated by it, all except Tyr. He still played with it and romped with it, and he alone fed the wolf its meat each day. And each day the beast ate more than the day before, and each day it grew and it became fiercer and stronger. Odin watched the wolf child grow with foreboding, for in his dreams the wolf had been there at the end of everything. And the last things Odin had seen in any of his dreams of the future were the topaz eyes and the sharp white teeth of Fenris Wolf. The gods had a council and resolved at that council that they would bind Fenrir. They crafted heavy chains and shackles in the forges of the gods and they carried the shackles to Fenrir. Here, said the gods as if suggesting a new game. You have grown so fast, Fenrir. It is time to test your strength. We have here the heaviest chains and shackles. Do you think you can break them? I think I can, said Fenris Wolf. Bind me. The gods wrapped the huge chains around Fenrir and shackled his paws. He waited motionless while they did this. The gods smiled at each other as they chained the enormous wolf. Now, shouted Thor. Fenrir strained and stretched the muscles of his legs, and the chains snapped like dry twigs. The great wolf howled to the moon, a howl of triumph and joy. I broke your chains, he said. Do not forget this. We will not forget, said the gods. The next day, Tyr went to take the wolf his meat. I broke the fetters, said Fenrir. I broke them easily. You did, said Tyr. Do you think they will test me again? I grow, and I grow stronger with every day. They will test you again. I would wager my right hand on it, said Tyr. The wolf was still growing, and the gods were in the smithies, forging a new set of chains. Each link in the chains was too heavy for a normal man to lift. The metal of the chains was the strongest metal that the gods could find, iron from the earth mixed with iron that had fallen from the sky. They called those chains dromi. The gods hauled the chains to where Fenrir slept. The wolf opened his eyes. Again, he said. If you can escape from these chains, said the gods, then your renown and your strength will be known to all the worlds. Glory will be yours. If chains like this cannot hold you, then your strength will be greater than that of any of the gods or the giants. Fenrir nodded at this and looked at the chains called Dromi, bigger than any chains had ever been, stronger than the strongest of bonds. There is no glory without danger, said the wolf after some moments. I believe I can break these bindings. Chain me up. They chained him. The great wolf stretched and strained, but the chains held. The gods looked at each other, and there was the beginning of triumph in their eyes. But now the huge wolf began to twist and to writhe, to kick out his legs and strain in every muscle and every sinew. His eyes flashed, and his teeth flashed, and his jaws foamed. He growled as he writhed. He struggled with all his might. The gods moved back involuntarily, and it was good that they did so, for the chains fractured and then broke with such violence that the pieces were thrown far into the air, and for years to come, the gods would find lumps of shattered shackles embedded in the sides of huge trees. 
at the side of the mountain. Yes, shouted Fenrir, and howled in his victory like a wolf and like a man. The gods who have watched the struggle did not seem, the wolf observed, to delight in his victory, not even tear. Fenrir, Loki's child, brooded on this and on other matters. And Fenris wolf grew huger and hungrier with each day that passed. Odin brooded and he pondered and he thought, all the wisdom of Mimir's well was his and the wisdom he had gained from hanging from the world tree a sacrifice to himself. At last he called the light elf Skirnir, Frey's messenger to his side and he described the chain called Gleipnir. Skirnir rode his horse across the rainbow bridge to Svartalfheim with instructions to the dwarfs for how to create a chain unlike anything ever made before. The dwarfs listened to Skirnir describe the commission and they shivered and they named their price. Skirnir agreed as he had been instructed to do by Odin, although the dwarfs price was high. The dwarfs gathered the ingredients they would need to make Gleipnir. These were the six things the dwarves gathered. The firstly, the footsteps of a cat. The secondly, the beard of a woman. For thirdly, the roots of a mountain. For fourthly, the sinews of a bear. For fifthly, the breath of a fish. For sixth and lastly, the spittle of a bird. Each of these things was used to make Glipnir. You say you have not seen of course you have not. The dwarves used them in their crafting. When the dwarves had finished their crafting, they gave Skirnir a wooden box. Inside the box was something that looked like a long silken ribbon, smooth and soft to the touch. It was almost transparent and weighed next to nothing. Skirnir rode back to Asgard with his box at his side. He arrived late in the evening after the sun had set. He showed the gods what he had brought back from the workshop of the dwarfs, and they were amazed to see it. The gods went together to the shores of the Black Lake, and they called Fenrir by name. He came at a run, as a dog will come when it is called, and the gods marveled to see how big he was and how powerful. What's happening? asked the wolf. We have obtained the strongest bond of all, they told him. Not even you will be able to break it. The wolf puffed himself up. I can burst any chains, he told them proudly. Odin opened his hand to display Gleipnir. It shimmered in the moonlight. That, said the wolf, that is nothing. The gods pulled on it to show him how strong it was. We cannot break it, they told him. The wolf squinted at the silken band that they held between them, glimmering like a snail's trail or the moonlight on the waves, and he turned away, uninterested. No, he said, bring me real chains, real fetters, heavy ones, huge ones, and let me show my strength. This is Glepnir, said Odin. It is stronger than any chains or feathers, chains or fetters. <laughs> Are you scared, Fenrir? Scared? Not at all. But what happens if I break a thin ribbon like that? Do you think I will get renown and fame that people will gather together and say, do you know how strong and powerful Fenris Wolf is? He is so powerful he broke a silken ribbon. <laughs> there will be no glory for me in breaking Glepnir. You are scared, said Odin. The great beast sniffed the air. I scent treachery and trickery, said the wolf his amber eyes flashing in the moonlight. And although I think your Gleipnir may only be a ribbon, I will not consent to be tied up by it. You, you who broke the strongest, biggest chains there ever were, you were scared by this band, said Thor. I am scared of nothing, growled the wolf. I think it is rather that you little creatures are scared of me. Odin scratched his bearded chin. You are not stupid, Fenrir. There is no treachery here. 
but I understand your reluctance. It would take a brave warrior to consent to be tied up with bonds he could not break. I assure you, as the father of the gods, that if you cannot break a band like this, a veritable silken ribbon, as you say, then we gods will have no reason to be afraid of you, and we will set you free and let you go your own way. A long growl from the wolf. You lie, old father. You lie in the way that some folk breathe. If you were to tie me up in bonds I could not escape from, then I do not believe you would free me. I think you would leave me here. I think you plan to abandon me and to betray me. I do not consent to have that ribbon placed on me. Fine words and brave words, said Odin. Words to cover your fear at being proved a coward, Fenris Wolf. You are afraid to be tied with this silken ribbon. No need for more explanations. The wolf's tongue lolled from his mouth. And he laughed then, showing sharp teeth, each the size of a man's arm. Rather than question my courage, I challenge you to prove there is no treachery planned. You can tie me up if one of you will place his hand in my mouth. I will gently close my teeth upon it, but I will not bite down. If there is no treachery afoot, I will open my mouth when I have escaped the ribbon, or when you have freed me, and his hand will be unharmed. There, I swear, if I have a hand in my mouth, you can tie me with your ribbon. So, whose hand will it be? The gods looked at each other. Balder looked at Thor, Hemdal looked at Odin, Honir looked at Frey, but none of them made a move. Then Tyr, Odin's son, sighed and stepped forward and raised his right hand. I will put my hand in your mouth, Fenrir, said Tyr. Fenrir lay on his side, and Tyr put his right hand into Fenrir's mouth, just as he had done when Fenrir was a puppy, and they had played together. Fenrir closed his teeth gently until they held Tyr's hand at the wrist without breaking the skin, and he closed his eyes. The gods bound him with Glepnir. A shimmering snail's trail wrapped the enormous wolf, tying his legs, rendering him immobile. There, said Odin. Now, Fenris Wolf, break your bonds. Show us all how powerful you are. The wolf stretched and struggled. It pushed and strained every nerve and muscle to snap the ribbon that bound it. But with every struggle, the task seemed harder, and with every strain, the glimmering ribbon became stronger. At first, the gods sniggered. Then the gods chuckled. Finally, when they were certain that the beast had been immobilized and that they were in no danger, the gods laughed. Only Tyr was silent. He did not laugh. He could feel the sharpness of Fenris Wolf's teeth against his wrist, the wetness and warmth of Fenris Wolf's tongue against his palm and his fingers. Fenris stopped struggling. He lay there unmoving. If the gods were going to free him, they would do it now. But the gods only laughed the harder. Thor's booming guffaws, each louder than a thunderclap, mingled with Odin's dry laughter, with Baldur's bell-like laughter. Fenrir looked at Tyr. Tyr looked at him bravely. Then Tyr closed his eyes and nodded. Do it, he whispered. Fenrir bit down on Tyr's wrist. Tyr made no sound. He simply wrapped his left hand around the stump of his right and squeezed it as hard as he could to slow the spurt of blood to an ooze. Fenrir watched the gods take one end of Glepnir and thread it through a stone as big as a mountain and fasten it under the ground. Then he watched as they took another rock and used it to hammer the stone deeper into the ground than the deepest ocean. Treacherous Odin, called the wolf. If you had not lied to me, I would have been a friend to the gods, but your fear has betrayed you. I will kill you, father of the gods. I will, will wait until the end of all things, and I will eat the sun, and I will eat the moon, but I will take the most pleasure in killing you. The gods were careful not to get within reach of Fenrir's jaws. 
But as they were driving the rock deeper, Fenrir twisted and snapped at them. The god nearest him, with presence of mind, thrust his sword into the roof of Fenris wolf's mouth. The hilt of the sword jammed in the wolf's lower jaw, wedging the jaw open and preventing it from ever closing. The wolf growled inarticulately, and saliva poured from its mouth, forming a river. If you did not know it was a wolf, you might have thought it a small mountain with a river flowing from a cave mouth. The gods left that place where the river of saliva flowed down into the dark lake, and they did not speak. But once they were far enough away, they laughed some more and clapped each other on the back and smiled the huge smiles of those who believe they have done something very clever indeed. Tyr did not smile, and he did not laugh. He bound the stump of his wrist tightly with a cloth, and he walked beside the gods back to Asgard, and he kept his own counsel. These, then, were the children of Loki. Is bedtime like that every night at your house? <laughs> Actually, I, I started doing the audiobooks once my kids had grown up and I no longer got to do that every night <laughs> at my house. You know, that I, I, remember, I remember the day it all went dark. Um, we were halfway through the first book of His Dark Materials and Maddie looked up at me and she said, I think I'll finish it myself, Dad. And I was just like, no. <laughs> so I, that's really how I get my, my reading aloud. Jones out of the way. So, shall we go uh, through the, we'll do a round robin of the, the remaining questions in the, in the time it. that we have left. But of course, as you can imagine, there are a number of questions wondering how satisfied you are with the television adaptation of American Gods, which is premiering shortly. I'm really, really excited. Um, I've seen finished versions of about three quarters of the first eight. I think I've seen six in, in completely finished form and I'm just waiting to see the last couple with all of the effects and, you know, they're still, they're still working on the effects and the music and stuff. Um, but it's astonishing. It's really good. Um, some of my favorite bits are bits that aren't in the book which is really fun for me, but are absolute, they're not in the book, they're absolutely in the spirit of the book because the joy of a TV series um, is in the book. You're following Shadow around and almost very, very rarely do we actually pull our sort of camera off Shadow. He's how we see things. Um, but. I don't know if it's giving too much away here, but, but for example, episode four of the TV series is Laura's story and his wife. And it begins the week before she meets him. And you find out how they met and you find out um, how they started going out and, and their marriage and what happened. and when he went to prison and what she did while he was in prison and how she wound up getting killed and, um, and what happened to her after death and, and you know, what she's doing in his motel room. Um, and it's, it's stuff that is there in the novel, but you never find it out. You just go, well, this must have happened and you get little bits of moments of things through him thinking of things, but, but you don't get that. So I love the fact that we can take the camera off Shadow and we can follow him around. We can take storylines which exist in the book, but then characters come on stage and they go off. It's like, well, now we can follow them and we can find out what they were doing while we weren't looking at them. And we can, uh, you know, we can make this grow. We can make it more strange and big. So, I mean, I mean, when I tell people that we end the first season, which is eight episodes long, just before we're on the way to the House on the Rock, 
people who've read the novel go, that's, that's kind of, you know, that's not very far through. And it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> and partly that is because we have borrowed a few things from later in the book and moved them earlier so that we can get to meet people a little bit quicker. Um, but partly it's just because of the, the, the sheer joy of the way that we're doing it. We can, you know, at one point, um, it, you know, Mad Sweeney is one of my favorite characters in the novel, but he's not on stage very much. You meet him once in, in Jack's Crocodile Saloon, you meet him, um, you know, dying under a bridge, and then he's dead, and, and you don't know what was happening to him the rest of the time. And in the TV show, he's, you get to follow him around, and he's wonderful. He's even better than I had hoped. And, and the adventures of Mad Sweeney, once he has lost his lucky coin and his luck, are an absolute delight. I think this is a question that only a PBS slash NPR reporter sitting in the Boston Public Library could ask you, but if you could become instantaneously fluent in another language so that you could read its literature, what language would you choose? Chinese. Definitely Chinese. Um, there's a whole load of old Chinese literature that I started some years ago working on a project that I've put on the back burner. It isn't cancelled, but it's sort of, I've gone, you know, I, I have other things that I need to finish, and this was starting to take up my entire life. Um, the, um, it was um, researching the Monkey King and the, the story of the Monkey King, the story of the journey to the West, and also the real life uh, journey to the West of the real life Shenzhen, the monk um, who, who did that, that trek to India to bring back the Buddhist texts. Um, and there was an enormous amount of frustration just knowing that I was reading translations. What is your favorite Sinatra song? <laughs> um, great question. Um, that's what I wish that you'd said to me outside. Hey, we got the question, what's your favorite Sinatra song? Because so, now I'm doing that thing where you just raise, you, you bring every single Sinatra song in front of you and go, are, are you it? Is it you? I got you under my skin? No, I don't think it's you. What about you, Strangers in the Night? Well, it could be me, Strangers in the Night. But then, you know, one for my lady and one, oh, one for my baby and one more for the road. And, and, and you get into all of those great songs which basically have to be sung in smoky bars at three o'clock in the morning when she's left you. Um, <laughs> you know, and I don't really mind which one, just as long as it's a, it's a 3 a.m. My heart is broken. I'm going to put this on the jukebox. Talk to me, bartender. <laughs> One of those kind of songs. Are you trying to be this scary, or does it just come naturally? Um, <laughs> you know, I think that I'm not scary at all. Um, but then, every now and then, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of write something and give it to people, and they give me that look. And you go, what, what? And they go, nothing. <laughs> and you know that they want to just sort of go off and check the list of unsolved crimes in places <laughs> that and make sure it wasn't you. Because anybody who thinks like that has to be. I, I, I like, I, I do love scary stuff, but I love scary as a condiment. I don't think I would ever want to write a novel. I'm happy writing scary short stories. But novels, it's like, drop a little scary in here once in a while, like, like a little salt, but I wouldn't want to make a meal of it. If 
Well, I have a couple of library questions, and I'm watching the president glare at me here. So I'll ask the question about, you spent, you talked about spending your childhood in libraries, and what do you see, especially, this is a perfect time for anyone who doesn't know to ask this question in this library, which has just been completely renovated, restored. Do you see that there's a, a cafe, there's a WGBH studio. It's, it's, it has a new life, a, a new purpose in some regard, but of course it remains a library. But what do you see as the relevance of libraries in today's society? I think libraries probably have more relevance right now than they've actually had for perhaps a hundred years. Um, libraries started out in an era in which knowledge was valuable because it was scarce. There was not enough knowledge around. If you wanted to find something, you had to go, if you wanted to know something, you had to go and find the book it was in, and finding that thing was hard. And at that point, librarians and, and libraries as stores of information, libraries as sanctuaries, and, and all the other things became very important. Um, these days, that's kind of turned on its head. You know, in the old days, it was like you were trying to find a flower in the desert, and that was why you were going off to find to to a library now it, it's like you're trying to find flowers in the jungle. Um, there's too much information. There is information everywhere. Um, there is information that isn't actually information. It's just sort of faux information that <laughs> looks like it's information, but it's not out there. Um, there's badly sourced information. There's misinformation. And there's information that is true, but it's not what you're looking for. And then there's the weirdness of the fact that, you know, um, not, uh, th there's, there's a lot of the stuff that was actually available in the early days. The web is now gone. And sometimes trying to find useful information is proving now much harder than it was even 10 years ago. Um, and you start going, well, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a, sort of cast of people who were actually trained <laughs> to go out there <laughs> into the world and bring you back. Um, the useful and important information that you need. And so you weren't having to wade through the swamp of gubbins that is weighing you down. And oddly enough, there are. Um, <laughs> and you also go, gee, in this world in which so much is migrating onto the web, that forces um, people, you, you know, it creates an underclass of people who do not have access to the web, who cannot apply, cannot look online for jobs, cannot apply for jobs online, cannot, you know, it's, it's the weirdness of watching politicians go, aha, there are poor people out there with iPhones. And you're going, good, how the, they, at least they can get onto the web. What's, what's worse is there are poor people out there without iPhones. Um, you know, and again, you go, well, wouldn't it be great if there was a nice, safe place where people could actually go and access the internet and perhaps ask questions if they had problems with literacy or whatever? And, and again, you go, ah, well, weirdly enough, a lot of these things exist already. Um, I think that... There is a short-sighted, I mean, I think it's so wonderful that this library, like Birmingham Library in England, like Salt Lake City Library, like a, a, there are a bunch of great libraries out there that have been uh, well-funded by whatever means and have been um, modified in a way that allows them to face forward in time. Um, but. The tragedy is right now, so many libraries are getting closed, so many libraries are not getting adequate funding, librarians are being dismissed, uh, beautiful, wonderful buildings are being closed to save money, and then you sort of learn that it's actually costing more to put security guards in these closed buildings than it would have been to keep them open and keep them running as libraries, and you just go, I, I genuinely, it's almost as if there is an actual anti-library agenda, as if it is to people's advantage to have people who cannot access the web, cannot in access information. And, and you go, well, I'm so in all ways, I am proud 
of librarians and proud of libraries and will support them until, you know, until I'm cold. And I think this may be, is this our, I'm looking at the timekeeper, okay. This is our last question. Where did you think you would be now uh, versus when you were 25 and how does it compare? Ah, 25 is a really good age to have picked. Because um, it was 1986 and I was a struggling young freelance journalist who wasn't struggling as quite as hard as he had the previous few years and actually could have become a real, you know, was being offered real jobs. And I, I sort of had two futures ahead of me. And there was a future in which I was going to go off and I was going to write comics and I was going to write books and I was going to make stuff up for a living. And it seemed a very weird and precarious future. Um, but it was the future that I wanted. And then there was a future in which I accepted one of these jobs, one of the editorial jobs, one of the newspaper actual staff jobs that I was being offered, and in which I knew that I would be in a safe place, I would be on a career track, I could raise, knew that I would be okay raising my children, and, and that, you know, I think somewhere fairly you know, somewhere on the cusp of 25, age 25, 26, I do remember, you know, living this weird freelance life where you were just at the mercy of the next check coming in. And, and I, I queried our electricity bill, not because I thought it was in any way wrong, but I'd learned that if you queried it, that you could only ever do this once, somebody would come over to your house and explain to you how you were using electricity and offer you advice, and that would buy you time. <laughs> it would buy me a week before they cut the electricity off, and in that week, a check would come in if I was lucky, and I would be able to pay the electricity bill. So I was in that kind of precarious world, and, and I think that was, so I could see these two futures, and, um, you know, I have to say this is, far and away the least likely version of the, the first choice anyway. I, you know, there's that sort of, what I really wanted was, I thought, okay, well, maybe there's a world in which I get to write comics, write some books, and, you know, become a solid sort of mid-list author who can basically pay the bills to live and by don't have to get a real job, but that would be, you know, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, so every now and then, you know, from probably about 1992 or 93 onwards, I am actually convinced that this is all some kind of weird illusion, <laughs> and I will wake up, and it will be, I will be 25 again going, well, that's not going to happen, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are all delighted to have been a part of your illusion, if that's the case. <laughs> We're honored to be invited. Neil Gaiman, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. biblical images burst out from this childhood frontier conversation. And this is one of them. It's about, uh, it's about the, act, the physical...